Let's go to the word of the Lord this morning out of Romans chapter 14, 7 to 9. Malachi, you're looking sharp, man. Should be preaching today, Malice. <laughs> Romans chapter 14, 7 to 9, the New King James Version. We're speaking on the topic, I am alive. Now, this congregation is a lot more alive than the 6 a.m. service. But we thank the Lord for those that came even at 6 a.m. to all of the volunteers, the workers, the leaders that were here very early, making sure that everything runs well. Put your hands together for them this morning. Let's read. For none of us lives to himself, and no one dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ died and rose and lived again. That he might be the Lord of both the dead and the living. May the Lord bless the exposition of his word this morning. By way of introduction... Allow me to, again, just comment on popular culture at this very moment. On Friday, one of the journalists, well-known, um, TV, radio personality, political commentator, wrote an article on Good Friday of all days, published in Times Live, and he's asking the question, if God exists, then why did he allow the flooding in KwaZulu-Natal? Now he goes on to confess that he's an agnostic. An agnostic is somebody that can't prove or disprove the existence of God. He goes on to argue his case that God then does not exist. Because if God allows suffering, how can he exist? How can God turn his face from his people. Now, admittedly, this person as well grew up in the Catholic Church, grew up as a Christian, but somewhere down life's path, he veered away, and now he's agnostic in his understanding. I said in the first service, I say this to you and I, there's a lot of people outside of the church that are living but they are not alive. And the church, like I said on Friday, the world will allow us to celebrate this weekend because they are living, but they are not alive. You and I are living, but we are alive. That's why the title of this message is this morning, I am alive. Because if we read the scripture that we've just done, Jesus is Lord over both the living and the dead. Meaning if we sing and shout about victory, if the grave has no victory, if death has no sting, then we can truly shout with the Apostle Paul and we can say, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. Which means that if he is risen, I am risen. If he is alive, I am alive. And the connection between being living and only and being alive is the connection of revelation. Because yes, he may have grown up in the church going through all the rituals and the traditions of the church. But between him living and being alive is revelation. Many are in the church. We are living and we are alive, but we struggle with the revelation. We struggle with who God is. We struggle with what he is showing us. We struggle with what he is revealing unto us of himself and what he's revealing of ourselves before him. So to make the connection 
from just living to being alive, you have to have the revelation. For you to shout like you do this morning, for you to sing like you do this morning, it's not just knowledge and experience, it's the revelation. It's the understanding that if I have the victory, if I sing, He's got the victory. If I sing that He is the victory, surely if I am in Him, I have the victory. Because I saw some people in front this morning. Now listen, don't, don't think I'm judging, don't think I'm condemning. But when I see certain people dancing, not the usual folk that come and dance, not the usual people that come and sing and come and worship, but I see some people that I don't necessarily see in front here worshiping, then I know something as these people, they've been through a few things. They've experienced some, some hurts and some pains now. They're standing here because there's a testimony on the inside. Revelation has finally dawned on them that, listen, I might be in church, but there is a deeper experience of Jesus that I need to have. And if it truly hasn't been for Jesus, I don't know if I would be standing here. I don't know if I would be singing like this. I don't know if I would be worshiping like this. If it hadn't been for Jesus, I know me and my family wouldn't be where we are right now. If it hadn't been for Jesus, I know I wouldn't be at peace in my heart heart at peace in my heart what stands between you being living and being alive in Christ is the revelation so when you see them dancing and singing it's not a show it's not to show off it's not to be liked by the pastor it's not to be liked by Bishop and Mamnila it is to show Jesus did something inside of me he did something for me that is why I can't stop my praise that is why I can't stop my worship because I I am alive in him. The empty, <laughs> borrowed tomb. It was a borrowed tomb. It wasn't even his own. Some of you have already bought your plot of land where they're going to lay you down. Gives the clearest God revelation of who God is. And how we are to know him. So that in turn, you and I get to know who we are in him. So we can shout out with the Apostle Paul in the book of Philippians chapter 3 and verse 10. That I may know him in the power of his resurrection. You are saved, sanctified, Holy Ghost filled. You are on your way to heaven when you walk in the power of the resurrection. If you don't know the power of the resurrection, all you do is tick the, the register that I am in church. When you don't live in the reality of the resurrection, all you do is say, I am but a Christian. There's a difference, and I must not make this difference like this. Revelation takes the difference between identifying as a Christian and identifying between a son and a daughter of the Most High God. Because if I'm a son and a daughter of the Most High God, I recognize that I must know Him. I must yadah Him. I must have not just the knowledge, but the experience. I must go through this thing that Jesus went through. Through His sufferings, I am made one with Him. So if I suffer, I don't cry about it. I don't lose my mind about it. I don't feel the hurt about it. If I suffer, I recognize that he is a suffering servant and if he overcame suffering according to what Paul writes and he says our, our affliction is but for a moment. Our suffering is but for a moment. A mo uh, uh, what you call this word? A moment. A mo I can't get to the right English word now. It is just but for a moment. My English is up. It's just about a moment. It's just but for a moment. If I suffer with him and I identify that he is a suffering servant, surely he will not put something on me that I cannot handle. I am a son. I am a daughter of the Most High God. I am never outside of his purview. I am never outside of his eyes. He sees me. And if he sees me, Pastor Miriam, I know as a son, as a daughter, by revelation, if I speak those things that be not, though it will come and it will manifest because... It's revelation that I may know him. 
Some of us are overanalyzing everything. You're listening to me right now, and you're overanalyzing it. He didn't have the right English word to say. His English ran out. You are seated here, and your brain is working overtime. Because what you see around you don't make sense. What you're hearing don't make sense. It comes by the knowledge. Going from just what I read to what I've experienced. The word yada in Hebrew and in Greek gives the same thing. It's experience. It's the intimacy of walking with God. And it comes by way of revelation. Because revelation comes through his word, our experience with him. God alone gives revelation. God alone gives us the understanding of who he is. Peter and the disciples are with Jesus in Caesarea Philippi, a place of high worship. They are, they are surrounded by other gods and other temples and they can see the sacrifice and the offering that people have brought for these other gods. Jesus turns around and says, who do men say I am? They say, but you are but one of the prophets. Nothing wrong likening Jesus to a prophet. Nothing wrong, wrong likening Jesus to somebody that they know of and they can, they can identify with. Nothing wrong but Jesus says, who do you say I am? Peter jumps up and by the power of revelation, Peter is not a learned man. Peter is not a, 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 a well-trained man. He's an uncouth man. He's a rude man. He, he's raw. He's a man that has no sense of how he speaks. But when the revelation hit Peter, Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Peter, 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 what you've just said is not of your own mind, but it comes from the Father. Therefore, Peter, the revelation that you've just received gives you now the keys of the kingdom. So what you bind here on earth will be bound in heaven. What you lose here on earth will be loosed in heaven. My family, my brothers, my sisters, let me tell you, heaven is always open. But if it's not open past the markers, it's because you don't know you've got the keys to open heaven. You are crying, why not me? Why is the blessing missing me? Why is favor not on me? Why? You don't have revelation. The keys are in your hands. I'm going to pick on them again. That's why we run to every prophet. Open heaven by revelation. The keys are in my hands. The keys are in my hands. I can open and I can close heaven. You see, revelation says to us, revelation takes us from what is just mere knowledge to the understanding of who God is. So for all the overanalyzers, for all the overthinkers in the room today, all you need is revelation. Maybe just for a moment say, Jesus, I've tried to think about this. I've made my own plans, but I see only this, the blockage and the blockage and the blockage. I see my own understanding about this. Maybe I don't see it the way I'm supposed to see it. Father, release revelation in this very room right now. Shift the hearts and the minds of your people that they tap into what heaven says about them and what heaven is giving to them. Because revelation is the key to activation. Revelation is the key to activation. On the other side of that sits faith. Faith and revelation activates, activates, and it brings and it opens the doors for us that are locked in our lives. You see, my brothers and my sisters, I understand that there can be no door locked before me because if God opens it, if I'm already under the blessing and I'm his son and his daughter, I know the door is open. You must recognize if the door is open, but it's not 
not, you can't walk through. It's because the, king, the kingdom of darkness has put a blockage right in front of the door. And the enemy says, do you have enough revelation for you to activate your faith, to move the stronghold, to move the, 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 the principalities and the powers of darkness? Have you, do you have enough faith in you to walk through and say, I will walk where God has called me to walk? All by revelation. Revelation is the key to application. Because Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. It's the key to application. It's the key to truth. It's the key to understanding that if I apply it correctly, if I don't just take the word and use it for when I feel like I need to use it, if I don't just take the word and apply it for when I think, you know, now I'm sick, so let me get all the healing scriptures. Now I need money, so let me create, get all of the prosperity scriptures. If we take the word of God holistically in our lives, if we take the good, the bad, and the ugly of the word of God, if we take the exhortation, and if we take the, admonish, the admo admonition of the word in the same time, then truth and light comes to us. You can't apply the word willy-nilly. You can't apply the word just for you to work when you need it. You have to do and you have to hear, you have to apply, and you have to love it. There's a sermon I'm working on speaking about the blessing. And seven things that bring the blessing. And it's all based on how you apply God's word. It's all based on how you've root and ground yourself in God's word. Because if you are alive, it can't be that the word is far from you. If you are going to declare that I am alive, it can't be that the word is only open to you on a Sunday morning. The only time that you check in with the word is Sunday morning. That's not how it works. That's not how revelation works. Revelation is the key to manifestation. If you want to see the presence, the power, and the providence of God, you have to have revelation. You have to have revelation. And can I say this? Sometimes the people of the world will have a deeper sense of revelation than we have. Because Daniel's three friends find themselves... In the fiery furnace. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego thrown in the fiery furnace. And the Bible says that King Nebuchadnezzar, he told them to turn the fire seven times hotter. Seven times the more. But when the king comes, and he comes and looks, because now the people outside the furnace are dying. <laughs> but these three are not but when the king comes and he takes a look into the furnace, he sees a fourth one. He turns around and he says, did we not throw in three? He says, but why does the fourth one look like the son of God? <laughs> Daniel, Daniel is thrown into the lion's pit. The king says to him when he comes out the next morning, he says, surely your God is with you. Because surely even in the pit you were at peace. The lions did not overtake you. Tuesday evening, Pastor Miriam was here and she spoke to us about the angelic hosts protecting and watching over us. Joshua crossed the river Jordan with all the people. We spoke about that. He stands ready to attack Jericho, but he's got no army. Because his army is down. They are lying down. They are recovering from circumcision. And as he walks towards Jericho, the angel, the commander of the army comes to Joshua. Stands in front of him. Joshua thinks it's just but another man. He says, are you for us or are you against us? The angel turns around and says, the commander of the armies of the Lord has now come. Family. Understand this, 
You want manifestation? It takes revelation. You want manifestation of his presence, his power, and his providence? You have to see with eyes beyond the natural. You have to see with eyes and a heart beyond the natural. That the army, the commander, stands in front of you. What does Joshua do? He falls on his, on his face before the commander. The commander says the same thing that was said to Moses at the burning bush. He says, take off your shoes. Because this is holy ground. Can I tell you what the revelation of that is for you and I? Can I tell you what the Lord is saying? Because he said it to Moses to show he's with Moses. Now he's saying it to Joshua to show you that he's with Joshua. But the revelation is this. That if I want the manifestation of God, if I want to see his power and his presence, everywhere I go, I must be holy. Because God only moves in holiness. God only manifests where there's holiness. God only manifests where there's purity. How could the angel manifest to Mary the virgin? Because Mary was pure. She was not touched by any man. She was touched by the angel himself. She could see because where God moves, there's holiness. So what does that mean? It means family, wherever you and I go, we cannot switch off. We cannot let a moment go by where we are not switched on to what God wants. You may walk into your office, into the boardroom, but listen, you must walk in there in meditation of the Spirit being with you. You must walk in there with your mindset on the things that are above and things that are not beneath. You know how you will make contributions in the boardroom when they call on you for strategic input. It's my mind is on the things that are above and the things that are not here on the earth. Because Lord, let me see beyond what is being spoken spoken about right now because when I, I walk into this boardroom there may be people that don't believe but this ground is holy because you are with me <laughs> revelation brings manifestation revelation is the key to glorification now I know in most cases theology will teach us the glorification is our final state of being. Glorification is when we are in the presence of Jesus. That means when we have been translated into heaven and to paradise. That's what theology teaches us. But in Revelation, when we speak of glorification, it means of the perpetual state of our being. That he crowns my head with glory. He crowns me with favor. Everywhere I go, it's the acceptable year because I am the son and the daughter of God. Everywhere I go, if we read uh, Matthew, Luke chapter 4, and you see, read about Jesus speaking, uh, John, uh, Isaiah chapter 61, he says that now you must recognize that this is the acceptable year of the Lord. If we are living in revelation and we are glorified by the revelation, every day is acceptable. Because nothing can separate us from the love of God. Now you that have had struggle, strife over this last two years, all of us, the pain. We are blessed, we are graced, we didn't lose loved ones in my family. Other families... We've seen the devastation. But we know that in our mourning, he exchanges that. He exchanges it for the oil of joy. That means that if I take the glory of God and I make it my own, I will not be in the state of mourning for long. Because the oil of joy is always flowing. It's my perpetual state of being. Children of God, let me say this to you and I. We have to recognize if we live in the revelation that I am alive. And not just living. If I live in that revelation that he is my God and I am his. Then there is nothing impossible, nothing improbable for God to do and for me to accomplish. 
Because if God gives me the revelation of who I am, surely he must make provision in everything. Even in my moments, Paul writes to the church at Philippi in, 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 in the book of, of Philippians chapter 4. He says, he says to us, listen, in everything I've learned to be content. It's my perpetual state of being. If I have, it's okay. If I don't have, it's okay. If I'm in pain, it's okay. If I'm in joy, it's okay. Because I've learned to be in the perpetual state that God desires me to be. Do you know what is growth for us? Do you know what will show our growth to the world? If we can truly show a testimony that we are unmoved. If we can show a testimony that we are unafraid. If we can show a testimony that we are unashamed. If we can show a testimony that through the ups and the downs of life, I stay rooted. I will bend, but I will not break. I will go through the fire, but I will not be burned. I need to speak that. As I was saying, the Lord said, say that to somebody. Yeah. You are in the fire right now, like the three Hebrew boys. But you will come out of there unburned. Yeah. Pastor, it's not possible. Yes, it's not possible if you say it's not possible. Yeah. Pastor, it can't happen. Yes, it can't happen if you believe it can't happen. I am alive, and it takes the revelation of who God is. It takes the revelation. You people all standing and clapping at that empty tomb. The revelation of that empty tomb says that if he's alive, I am alive. The revelation of that empty tomb says if he is risen, I am risen. So will we have down moments? Yes, we will, but we rise again. Will we have painful moments? Yes, we will. But we know in the midst of the pain, there is covering and there is comfort. Will we have moments of lack? Yes, we will. But we know that he who owns a cattle on a thousand hills, he sees me in the moment of my lack and my want. And he will, he will, he will provide. Why would he lie to me? He's no man that he would lie. He's no respecter of person that he would say he would do it for Marcus but not for Adrian. He's not a man that he would look at us and favor us because of what we do for him and what we don't do for him. He is God. And if he is unmoved by the ebbs and the flows of life, we must be unmoved. Janine and I, we went to go pray years back for somebody in hospital in ICU. And we've never seen so many machines around this person and every machine you can think of. And as we stood there, every time we see this guy on Facebook and on WhatsApp, we, say, we look at each other, we say, this guy was dead. <laughs> this guy was dead. When we stood there, the Lord says to us, be not moved by what you see. And we said that, and his wife looked at us like, made no sense. I say this to you this morning as I close this out. I didn't even touch the whole sermon. <laughs> be not moved. Because the revelation says, I am not just living. I am alive. And if you are alive, the same spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead. The scripture says, Pastor Marcus, now quickens. A quickening is like a vibration in your spirit. Quickens. You feel it. It says your mortal bodies, which means that there is mortality ahead of us, which means that we are but finite, but he's infinite. 
He's immortal. And if His Spirit quickens us, He raises us above the fray, above the struggle, and we can exclaim that we are alive. We grew up and we were told that song, He never promised us roses and skies ever blue. But listen, in the midst of all of that, I am alive. I am alive because He is alive. I have power because he gives me the power. I'm alive because I have the revelation of who God has made me to be. Father, as you, we pray over your people. We thank you for Resurrection Sunday. We thank you, Jesus, that we now turn our eyes towards the mountain. We turn our eyes beyond the mountain to Pentecost. Sunday. We turn our eyes beyond our pain, beyond the struggles of life, and we turn it to you. Because in all things, you've set us free. You've made us alive in you. May your people walk out of this room alive. May life start anew. May life start afresh. May life start with a great, powerful level of revelation. That if he is in me and I'm in him, I am not moved. Because we walk by faith and not by sight. We live in the overflow of what heaven has commanded and given to us. We live in the power of the resurrection. We live in the fullness of the resurrection. We live in the blessing of the resurrection. Bless this church. Bless your people. Father, those that need you, you are close to them. Those that desire more of you, you will increase them. And I thank you, Jesus, that as we've sung so beautifully, that victory belongs to Jesus. That the victory of the, of the cross and the grave never leave us. We walk in revelation. We walk in power. We walk in might. We bless you for this. In Jesus' holy name, amen and amen.